Welcome to Hamburgers and Horror, the home of meat, monsters, and manifestations of guilt. I'm Noah Hook, and today we're looking at 2008's Martyrs. This French-Canadian psychological horror follows two women, one of whom is seeking revenge for torture she experienced as a child. She and her best friend possibly identify the family responsible, and what follows is a twisty, thought-provoking, depressing series of events. And that's all I'm gonna say for now. I usually don't make a big deal about spoilers because I'm usually not covering new movies, but Martyrs is definitely a film you should watch before my review of it. But I also need to give a pretty big trigger warning for the movie and my review of it. If you are sensitive to self-harm or just graphic violence, this might be one for you to skip. I won't be putting verbal warnings up during the breakdown like usual because awful things are just happening pretty constantly throughout the movie. Okay, you've been warned. Martyrs was written and directed by Pascal Lagiere, who has brought us films like Saint Ange, The Tall Man, and Incident in a Ghost Land. He's big into gore and psychologically disturbing films, and most would agree that Martyrs is his magnum opus thus far. He and the film are integral to the new French extremity wave, a subgenre of transgressive films which generally explore deep-rooted human anxieties while also showcasing graphic violence, gore, and body horror. They are not happy films, and they are not for casual horror fans. Other films tied to New French Extremity include High Tension, Them, Frontiers, and Inside. The term is typically used around films made in the 2000s, but there are some excellent early examples from the 90s, and more recent continuations or homages to the genre include Raw, Titane, and Revenge. The film stars Mylene Jampanoy from Valley of the Flowers as Lucy, and Morhana Aloui from Maroc as Anna. These demanding roles were turned down by a lot of French actresses, and I have to say these two women really give it their all. Special effects were done by Bitter Moon's Benoit Lestang, as well as Pet Cemetery's Adrian Moreau. Cinematography was done by Nathalie moliabko Visotsky from Forgotten Flowers, and the score was made by electronic rock band Seppuku Paradigm. Martyrs premiered in 2008 at the Cannes Film Festival and was released theatrically in France and was released to DVD around a year later in the US. Unsurprisingly, it was a very divisive film among critics, some of whom couldn't get beyond the sheer brutality of the movie. Others were able to look past the blood for messages within it, and with a 64 and 69% on Rotten Tomatoes, it seems a majority of audiences are able to appreciate Martyrs. Loser alert, I've actually never seen Martyrs. I watched a bunch of reviews and spoiled it for myself, so I never bothered to actually put it on, but I'm excited to actually see how I like it today. Big thank you to my patron Horror Movie Syllabus for requesting Martyrs for me to review, and remember, if you want to help support this channel and request movies for me to review, the quickest way is to become a patron. Well, it's probably time we jump into the movie. I hope you're all ready to feel like shit after this, cause we're watching Martyrs. The movie opens on a bloody, bruised young girl fleeing from an abandoned industrial slaughterhouse as we switch into some grainy Super 8 footage of her. It is a documentary capturing what she told authorities after escaping, which is that she was kidnapped and abused in this building. The girl, named Lucy, was routinely starved, dehydrated, and exposed to freezing temperatures, but she won't give many details on everything she endured. Lucy initially struggles in her new orphanage environment, but eventually makes a caring friend named Anna. She is now being interviewed by police, who hope Lucy has shared more details on her abusers with her. Anna unfortunately doesn't know much and goes to check on Lucy when she misses lunch. She finds Lucy in a bathtub covered in slashes, and she tells Anna she didn't do this to herself. They barricade the door that night, but Lucy awakens to find it wide open. Someone bolts by her and she hides under the sheets, but soon realizes the perpetrator is under the bed. The figure, a scarred, naked woman, appears and screams like a banshee before attacking her. Now we jump 15 years later, where we meet the Belfon family, which includes super plumber mom Gabrielle, coffee drinker dad Robert, nosy sister Marie, and young and in love son Anthony. They participate in some normal family bantering and squabbling, and have some fun with a dead mouse? Robert goes to answer the doorbell and gets blown the fuck back by a shotgun toting Lucy. Gabrielle faces the same fate, and after some hesitation, so does Antony. She follows Marie to her room and flushes her out, and promptly shoots the young girl as well. 
She cries and screams, asking the dead family why they did that to her, as she believes this was the family that tortured her 15 years ago. She calls Anna at a payphone and confirms with her it was them, and that she has murdered them. Anna is pissed as this was not what they had planned, and she rushes over to pick her up. While she waits, Lucy begins to hear noises and realizes the scarred woman is in the house. She grabs the knife and tells the woman she's done it, but she still gets attacked. And it is quite an ass kicking. Lucy gets slashed on the back a bunch of times before she runs and hides upstairs, where a sound reminds her of a fellow prisoner she left behind 15 years ago. She checks to see if the coast is clear, but it is not. Lucy gets away and runs outside right into Anna, who comforts and bandages her up. Lucy tells her the woman is still inside, but Anna goes to check it out anyway. While clearly upset about this slaughter, she checks the bodies to make sure they are all dead, and Lucy listens as she tries to cry in secret. Anna stitches Lucy up and scolds her for risking both of them being caught, and one by one they drag the family members to a bathroom. Lucy assures her these were the people that tortured her, and Anna gives a rather unwanted kiss. Later that night, she dreams about her torture while sleeping and wakes up in dead Antony's bed. She watches Anna as she dumps the bodies in the big yard hole, and well, howdy fucking do, Mama Gabrielle is somehow still alive. Anna tells her to be quiet as Lucy comes down with her straight razor, and she successfully convinces her nothing is going on. As she drags Marie outside, she hears Lucy scream, who is once again being attacked by the scarred woman. Anna eventually manages to break down the door, after Lucy is stabbed a couple of times, and they run back to Antony's room. Lucy begs the woman for mercy, claiming she got revenge for her, and she has another flashback to her torture. This is a memory of her escape, as she encountered and left behind a terribly scarred woman to presumably be killed. She realizes Anna has locked her in, and is able to hear that Gabrielle is still alive. She exits via window and catches up with them, quickly bashing Gabby's head in with a mini sledge. Lucy is enraged that Anna tried to help her and starts breaking lots of shit, and she claims Anna has never believed her and just thinks she's crazy like all the rest. Then she starts hearing the scarred woman again, who makes her way downstairs to give Lucy a hug. Oh, and to slice her arm really wide open. Anna crawls over, revealing what we all pretty much knew, that the scarred woman is a figment of Lucy's mental illness. She gives herself some serious headbanging, but still has enough fight left to jump through a window. Anna follows her outside, where Lucy slits her own throat and drops to the ground. Anna weeps over her deranged, mutilated friend, even bothering to clean her corpse before falling asleep. Anna calls her mother for the first time in two years, and it's clear they don't have a good relationship. She asks her daughter if she's still with Lucy and begins maligning her, but Anna gets distracted by a noise. She opens up a cabinet to find a secret basement, and it's like a bougie snuff gallery. She looks over images of tortured humans ranging back to early photography, and continues on to find another lower level. She unlocks it and makes her way down, where she finds a scarred, emaciated woman with a contraption blocking her vision. She gains the woman's trust and unshackles her, and they make their way upstairs. She decides to run her a bath, I guess, and also decides she should be the one to remove the metal helmet on her? Girl, take her to the hospital. Fuck whatever consequences you may face, let this tortured woman get some painkillers. Well, she pries the damn thing off and the lady is grateful, and Anna apologizes to Lucy for not believing her. She wakes up later to hear the woman moaning though, as for whatever reason, she is slicing away at her own arm. The woman starts scraping her face against the wall, and out of nowhere she is shot in the head by this lady. A bunch of goons in black arrive and carry away the body, and Anna tells the lady who she and Lucy are. When she refuses to give any more answers, Anna is dragged down to the torture chamber and left handcuffed to a wall. Gabrielle, the tortured woman, and Lucy are added to the mass grave, and let's be real, that hole is going to take forever to fill. The lady goon and a male counterpart handcuff Anna to a chair and set up a table, as it's time to introduce the mastermind behind all this. Simply named Mademoiselle, she acknowledges that their group was less organized 15 years ago, hence why Lucy was able to escape them. 
She describes Lucy as a systematically created victim and asks what kind of horrible visions her torture left her with. Anna shares that she would see a dead woman, and Mademoiselle says that Metal Plate Lady envisioned herself covered in cockroaches, which is why she was slicing her own skin off. She goes on to say that victims are common, but what they are looking for are martyrs, people who can take all of the pain, fear, and trauma and transcend themselves. She tells the stories of a dozen people who were tortured, beaten, or terminally ill, and points out how all of them seem to be transcending moments before their deaths, as if they are seeing something beyond this world. Before leaving, she also states that young women have the highest success for transcending, which is definitely bad news for Anna, who gets some sleepy time. She wakes to find herself chained up in the holding cell, and unsuccessfully tries to break her restraints. Anna spends quite some time in isolation before a goon comes down, and is force-fed that nasty green shit and slapped when she spits it out. More miserable time passes before the man goon enters and unshackles her, but this is only to give her false hopes of escape and to beat her. Next they cut off all of her hair and she gets more of the pea soup treatment. The beatings get worse and worse and she is given the very occasional sponge bath. Anna is black and blue at this point and it's clear this trauma is taking an extreme mental toll on her. She imagines or remembers a conversation with Lucy who says the best way to stop being afraid is to let yourself go. She now eats and drinks without resistance and makes no attempts to defend herself during her beatings. The Lady Goon tells her she will be okay soon as they are moving on to the next and final stage, after which Anna will never have to defend herself again. They strap the poor woman into a rotating torture device and after removing her clothes, they begin to flay her alive. They have somehow removed the skin from every inch of her body aside from her face, somehow not killing her in the process. The Belfon 2.0s are amazed that she hasn't succumbed to this torture, and the Lady Goon calls Mademoiselle when she believes Anna has finally transcended into another world. It does appear that Anna has entered some sort of numbing, euphoric space in her head. Is it heaven? Hell? We better ask Anna before she drops dead. Mademoiselle asks her if she saw the next life, and what Anna whispers to her leaves her astounded. Other members of this bizarre secret society arrive at the house, and a leader informs them that a woman has successfully been martyred. She is only the fourth person they have gotten to this stage in their 17 years of torturing people, so they're really not efficient, and she is the first to relay what she saw on the other side. They believe what she saw was where we go after death, and her journey lasted about two hours. Mademoiselle is to share that message with them, who is currently removing her finery in the bathroom. The other member named Etienne asks her if Anna truly saw something, and Mademoiselle confirms that she was very clear. She asks Etienne if he can imagine what comes after death, and he says he cannot. She tells him to keep on doubting and shoots herself in the head. We learn the Greek translation for martyr is witness, and the movie ends with Anna still alive and in this catatonic state. Oh, and there is some nice footage of Anna and Lucy as kids during the credits just to make sure you feel awful. And that's Martyrs. I think it's a spectacular, artistic, really clever film. Let me be clear that this is a depressing, uncomfortable film, so while it's not something I'll watch often, it is a movie that actually left me thinking about it after the credits rolled, which is pretty rare. Throwing us right into the chaos with the home invasion revenge plot is a great way to begin, and it also has you wondering where this story will go. I obviously knew how things would play out, but I have to imagine that the entrance of this secret society, as well as a few other twists, really take first-time viewers by surprise. Before and after Anna's capture, while both being very violent, feel like pretty different movies kind of jammed together. But by the end, those more surreal aspects like Lucy's visions begin to make a lot more sense. And of course, it leaves us to also ponder the question that the secret society wanted to know. It is left up to interpretation as to what Anna told Mademoiselle as her final words are left very vague. If you ask me, I would guess that Anna told her there was nothing at the end of that tunnel and there was nothing after death. That would make Mademoiselle's final statement very literal to keep on doubting, and it would also make her realize that all the heinous acts she did were for nothing. 
But no matter what Anna said, I don't think her report was the kind of answer the society was hoping for. If it was, then Mademoiselle offing herself was a bit selfish. But the ending also translates further beyond the characters of this movie and wants us to process what we have just seen as well. Just as Mademoiselle is left to wonder why she has done the things she's done, we are left to wonder why we have watched this showcase of violence in the first place. Lucy's trauma, guilt, and mental illness are explored in a really interesting way, which is another big twist that is so tragic but unveiled so well. I will say the third act loses some of the unpredictability that most of the movie has going for it as it really just turns into Anna being brutalized. But unlike a lot of films that have been tossed into the torture porn catacombs, I find this decision to be really important. It's not about showcasing a bunch of guts and gore for us to enjoy, it's about us empathizing with Anna's pain. There is no hope for Anna, and the movie doesn't pretend that there is. Whether intentional or not, Anna's story is also a subtle but important examination of the invisibility of queer women of color. Anna's love for Lucy is ignored by her, denounced by her mother, and is ultimately what got her in this situation. And aside from clearly being on the fringes of society with Lucy, aspects like her queerness, color, and age make her the perfect target for the society to abduct. After looking past the martyrdom aspect, the abduction and captivity as well as the genuine lack of hope is much more realistic in this situation than a movie with a happy ending. The only little bit of light that Anna had near the end was her memory and love of Lucy. But I will say that Anna's final stage seems a little bit rushed and unearned. The lady that came before her seemed to be down there for years and they didn't try to martyr her, so I'm not sure what qualities they saw in Anna that made her a quick candidate for it. It's just a bit unclear how long Anna was down there and what really set her apart from the other victims. Generally speaking though, the ending succeeds at being thought-provoking. While the violence is very graphic and intense, you will ultimately be thinking about the more philosophical reasons behind it after the credits roll. I would definitely avoid martyrs if you're pretty sensitive to graphic violence and self-harm, but if you can handle it, it is definitely worth a watch. It has fantastic performances, a great use of its isolated setting, brutal violence and action sequences, and some top-notch gore. You'll definitely remember the violent scenes, but it'll be the quiet, sorrowful moments that really stick with you after the fact. Well, that's about it. Thank you to my patron horror movie syllabus for requesting Martyrs for me to review. I really enjoyed it. I'll see y'all in two weeks when we'll be starting a new franchise. Better bring some money for the Tooth Fairy, because we're going to start looking at all of Hannibal Lecter's theatrical outings, starting with Manhunter. Thank you all for joining me, and an extra thank you to my patrons. As always, I'm Noah Hook, and thanks for watching Hamburgers and Horror. Stay safe out there. Thanks for watching my review of Martyrs. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe so you can keep up with all my horror reviews. And if you want to help support the channel further, you should check out my Patreon account. You'll be able to vote for future movies and franchises I cover on the channel. Thanks y'all.